and welcome to Varm Blog. And today I'm here with Kaiser Gua of Sub China and the Seneca Podcast, which has been producing pretty much constantly for what eleven years now. Yeah, getting on twelve. Yeah, um, Kaiser came into my orbit uh, actually weirdly because I was listening to NPR um, in South Korea and trying to get a handle on the pivot to Asia, which very few people were covering in depth. And so I started listening to the early version of the of the Seneca podcast um, to try to get a better handle on U.S. Chinese relations, um, which you know I wanted to talk to you about this. We've seen a major shift in U.S. China relations in the last decade, but it, the. Sh- the shift seems to have finally gotten everyone's attention when the, you know, rhetorical uh, attacks on China did not end with the Trump administration. That's right. Uh, do you see this current uh, rhetorical hostility as an extension going all the way back to the pivot to Asia and the first part of the Obama um campaign? Or is it something else? And also, is it reciprocated on the other end? Well, yes to both questions. I do see it as an extension, basically, of you know a, a real downturn in relations that started really shortly after the financial crisis. I think that we have to date it to the end of 2008, the post-Olympic period. And there was one of these remarkable moments in history where, if you remember, the Lehman crash actually happened just almost three weeks to the day after the closing ceremony of the Beijing Olympics. It's almost, you know, too on the nose to be a good metaphor. Um, China was newly assertive. It was sort of feeling its oats. And the United States was in sort of crisis. And uh, China feels like it weathered that storm well. It came out of it with its economy still growing in a really robust fashion, making up even more of the the per capita GDP, of of the, uh, the global GDP, and especially more of growth. So, uh, there are a whole bunch of different reasons why, but I think that um, to go back to that that decade, the, the, it's really, really crucial to understanding why things went the way that they did. I think that um, many Americans are sort of oblivious to how American behavior was perceived in China to the threat that China actually saw. And it wasn't a, a military threat. It wasn't the presence of, you know, the Pacific fleet. It wasn't even the military aspects of the pivot to Asia, the placement of American troops in in Northern Australia, any of that. Um, It was really this sense of cultural insecurity that China was experiencing, this sense that um, American discursive power, American soft power uh, was on sort of naked display. uh, And it had been wrapping up since the end of the Cold War. And that felt uh, to Beijing very threatening. And so what we're seeing right now is is very much an extension of that. And you asked, has it, um, look, there have been important inflection points. I think that those of us who uh, were hoping that the temperature would come down quite a bit after January 20th, we were, I think, in for a pretty rude shock. We, we ended up with sort of Trump, but with allies, right? Uh, <laughs> with very little dial down, with none of the tariffs removed, with... Uh, yeah, so there wasn't the gratuitous insults coming out of the, the White House. There weren't, you know, they weren't, you know, using racial epithets and things like that that they were doing during the Trump administration. But um, yeah, in many ways, it feels worse because it's uh, less inchoate and more effective. So Beijing, is Beijing reciprocating? Well, yeah, I think um, certainly, and I think certainly since. The end of uh, well for for China has you know has it's not over for nobody is it over but China feels like it's emerged from the COVID nineteen pandemic in a better position than it went into it and uh, it feels more able to push back against what it sees as an extension of American hegemony. Do you think that is because um, Chinese strength are American weakness um, as far as like the way it's perceived in China itself? So it, these things are always, of course, comparative. They're relative. And mm-hmm. yeah, there is a certain certainly a perception that um, coming out of the Trump administration, American prestige, 
uh, were damaged abroad. They, they have no illusions about you know, American military power having diminished. It certainly hasn't. But uh, in, in this, at the same time, Chinese military power, is, as we're aware, has, has wrapped up appreciably during this, this same period. Uh, I mean, American military spending still dwarfs that of China in the next six, I think, uh, co- countries put together. But also keep in mind that China's military spending dwarfs that of the, the next six countries after it put together. Yeah, so I I think that's been kind of missed. However, it does seem like during this period, there's been a shift towards more social policy in China. This is going to bring us a little bit to the Red New Deal, but also the history of that needs to be understood until what the about the middle of the last decade, China had a higher Gini coefficient than the U.S., which sure. It's somewhat shocking to people who understand what that means, but most people don't. That's dropped somewhat dramatically in the last five or six years. Um, when I was doing comparatives, it's now now China is closer to Western Europe than it is to the United States. Um, is that is that correct? Is it closer? Is it actually closer to Western Europe than it is to the United States? I know that it's come down marginally in, in the last few years, but I don't know that it is actually. I think Western Europe is higher. To- but, than most people assume it is actually because I'm not comparing it to the Nordic sure, countries. No, it's 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 very high, and anyone who's visited China uh, certainly can see there's there's pretty massive wealth inequality, um, less income inequality, but much greater wealth inequality. And the reason for that is because most people's wealth uh, is actually in real estate, and a lot of that real estate was just sort of um, windfall real estate. Anyone who lives in a first tier city um, at the end of the 1990s when they had the opportunity to buy their state housing, uh, they were able to do that uh, for pennies on what it was worth uh, even then. And almost immediately, as soon as the secondary market came into existence in China, suddenly you saw a lot of wealth. So you have a phenomenon where there were a lot of people who nominally, their salaries are extremely low, but their their actual wealth, their actual uh, assets are, 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 are pretty handsome. My in-laws for are, are a very good example. They probably take in, uh, all told, probably less than five hundred dollars a month between them, but uh, they own two homes and and a very nice car, and uh, they travel internationally, all because of the real estate boon. So yeah, uh, high, key, high, definitely very very high Gini coefficient measured by wealth. It, it's funny because it, these kind of things are not really discussed on the far left, which is kind of what I follow, and a lot of far leftists don't even seem to know about the housing privatizations because it wasn't what happened in the former Soviet Union where right. where it was just oligarchs allowed to purchase these places. It was privatized to, to you know, to the people living in them. But it's had an effect um, that it favors one generation over another. I think another thing that's poorly understood is um, the the internal passport system in China. I mean, it does seem like it's been somewhat relaxed. Maybe I'm misunderstanding that. Um, but, you know, to keep a huge influx of the countryside into the city and create kind of, a, you know, a kind of lump in proletariat in, in China. And that was a big deal at the beginning, again, of the last decade. Um how much is current policy around poverty reduction in China still based off that? And wh- where have we, s- what have we seen in developments of like rural development in China? It's a great question. Um, I think that uh, the the hukou system, what you described as an internal passport system, mm-hmm. uh, it's a system of residence permits that created basically uh, two classes of citizens, uh, beginning in the nineteen. 19- um, well, in the, in the early 2000s, you saw a pretty significant relaxation of it, mm-hmm. uh, but it was sort of like marijuana laws. It was it, just that it wasn't prosecuted. It wasn't that it was um, abolished altogether. Uh, and there were still like, a lot of major impediments for rural people who come to the cities to work. They cannot, for example, have their children educated on the government's dime in, in cities. And there are, you know, sort of constant pressure on usually NGO run schools for rural migrant children uh, in the cities. They're constantly being shut down. Uh, 
<clears throat> the idea, though, behind the Hukou system, uh, it actually, it's a very old thing. It, it goes back to the Ming Dynasty, uh, their antecedents even earlier than that. But you, you have to understand, it wasn't, it was in intended and it has had the effect of preventing the creation of genuine belts of misery around major cities. They are not ulcerous, separating slums around Beijing, Shanghai, uh, or, or any of the other major cities in China. There are not favelas. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was the reason why they, they wanted to do this. They, they wanted to, of course, take advantage of the headwind, I'm sorry, of the tailwind that rural immigration generated and continues to generate. I mean, by the year 2030, 1 billion people will be living in Chinese cities, right? Uh, right now, it's already about 60, 62% of the population is urban. A lot of those, I mean, if you can th think about this, just 20 years ago, uh, the urbanization rate was only in the low 40s percent. So you've seen a lot of, of rural to urban migration. This has provided, of course, uh, uh, an inexpensive labor force. Uh, this has staffed all these, you know, uh, the delivery drivers for delivery apps and, and all of that stuff. A lot of what China ha has benefited from from enormously is this inflow. But the inequality is 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 horrific and and very pronounced, and it's made worse by the fact that a lot of these people simply cannot are either not even entitled to buy property and you know enjoy that boom, uh, or they can't afford it because property prices in upper tier cities are just so ridiculously high. Uh, cities like Beijing and Shanghai and Shenzhen are among the world's most expensive cities in terms mm. of property prices. Yeah, I, I uh, was actually kind of shocked when I went to Beijing and realized how expensive stuff was, even yeah. like, it was about, I guess, seven years ago. But um, the there's been a lot of talk of the reduction of extreme poverty in China and extreme. There's a lot of weight on that word extreme. Um, yeah. but the, but there is a sense in which, um, since the end of the cultural revolution up and through the mid two thousands, if you remove China from the developing world statistics, and I don't think you can consider China part of the developing world anymore, but, you would have the whole boom of capitalism would not have happened in most of the developing world. So you do when you put China back in, that's actually where those you know positive globalization statistics mostly came from, even though it's highly misleading giving Chinese policy. The <coughs> I, I think what's interesting about that though is there are a lot of things in China that people assume are there, particularly in the United States, because they hear the word communist. Um that aren't um one of the bigger ones is like trying to explain to people while they had good pandemic response in general like chinese healthcare is not bad but it's not really socialized in the way that we think of no, no. socialized medicine it's absolutely um, not it actually uh, has a lot more in common with the american healthcare system uh than it does with uh, with say the british or the canadian it's a very unfortunate healthcare system uh and uh, just like in the United States, a lot of people who work, especially in, in sort of white collar jobs, in uh, they depend entirely on their employers to provide uh, at least a heavy subsidy for their their uh, their health care. So health care is expensive in China. Now, it's not as expensive. It's 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 actually by global standards. It's 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 expensive, but not compared to the United States. Uh, and. You know, there are a lot of things. I mean, a lot of common drugs are heavily subsidized, so you don't end up paying a lot. Um, there are, you know, fairly high premiums, but fairly low deductibles and, and very low co-pays, co typically. Uh, but it's by no means a perfect system. Now, China, to, I mean, the upshot is, as you're saying, it's not the worker's paradise that I think a lot of people on the American left um, maybe want it to be or hope that it is. It certainly isn't. In fact, I think a lot of, of people of the left who have gone and lived in China and spent a lot of time there uh, have gone through an interesting process by which first their hopes or their, their, their illusions are, are, are sh shattered rather painfully at first. And then I've seen a lot of them kind of take the side of people that we might, 
you know, despised in, in America as as just sort of, you know, neoliberal fucks, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, a few years in China and suddenly they find themselves sort of rooting for the guy who uh, is about, you know, um, foreign direct investment and uh, coastal uh, development and, uh, you know, un unleashing entrepreneurship and all that stuff. And you know what? The, the reason why they do is because they find a lot of people in China uh, have, uh, you know, attribute their material welfare, the, the improvement, the obvious improvement of their material welfare to economic liberalization, to market reforms. And I think it's fair. Um, now, has it gone too far? Absolutely, it has. I mean, I think there are a lot of people who only sort of woke to it uh, because they they recognized, oh, wow, the air here is truly terrible. And, you know, <laughs> funny, yeah. I guess I've kind of been on the wrong side of that debate because I've always been, you know, rah, rah, more growth, you know, high GDP growth. Uh, and uh, they they find themselves suddenly realizing Maybe I was uh, a little too cavalier about this, and 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 thought, uh, and didn't think about you know sort of the very real costs of re of breakneck growth. Yeah, I mean the one of the ironies that I think Americans have a hard time understanding, probably because most Americans don't really understand economic history, uh, that like China's GDP growth has been slowing uh, relative to itself. Because as you become richer, your GDP growth tends to slow. Of course. Um, but it's also, it doesn't mean that it's not doing well, but it right. also doesn't, I also think people underestimate like the power of the business cycle in China, which is something that kind of has emerged in the last 20 years is there actually is a business cycle in, in, in China, similar sure. to everywhere else. Um this seems like a banal point to you know people who who are more familiar with China, but to a lot of leftists that actually surprises them because they 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 hear, for example, that like sixty percent of the economy is technically state owned and think something completely different than than what is actually going on. Right. Um, would you like to talk about what state ownership means in China? Because that I, that does seem to be something that's arcane to Americans, whether they're pro or anti China. Yeah, I mean, state ownership actually takes a lot of different forms. You have state-owned enterprises that are maybe as you imagine them to be with, mm. uh, you know, kind of uh, lethargic and unincentivized workers uh, who uh, are producing still to, I mean, it's, it's there's no command economy, of course, but, you know, who, who um, they don't feel that sort of... Uh, fire to their rear that they they need to to you know um to move up or move out that kind of thing that, that, um, there are others who where you would walk into their offices and believe you were most certainly in you know a a multinational company where um everyone is is really hustling where management uh, makes 200 300x what the lowest level employees make uh where they're they are competing in global markets and are run very much like we are our, our sort of um, idealized notion of like a, a a good private multinational company would be run they they run the entire gamut right uh state owned in china does not mean slothful and and unproductive mm -hmm. uh, and inefficient uh it can there certainly are plenty of companies that are still like that but uh yeah. So I, there's two things that come to mind. Um, one thing is the kind of seeming growth, and it's hard for someone outside China to to know how much this growth is real and how much is per, per, perceived um, of neo Maoism in China, um, and also the change in what that term means. Because like when people think of Xi, uh, of Xi, Xi. Um, they yeah. Um, they they tend to forget like that his first real you know solidification of power was to crack down on Bojilai, um, which which was a figure strongly associated with the with the left of what with the Communist Party by our 
our definitions, although in China, right, it just means, you know, out of sync with the government generally. So he's probably has been deemed a rightist. But <laughs> um, and then the the way neo Maoism was described about five years later, is it was very much in line with with the um, with the with the center of the CPC, with the exception that uh, it was more supportive of labor actions within China itself. Um, is that accurate at all? I mean, I know that's uh, kind of the stance of people who are scholars of neo Maoism in the West, but um, it's hard to get a feeling for how how pronounced that is. I also know there's certain leftists who want it to be a much bigger thing than it probably is. Yeah, there's it's oh, first of all, it's 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 not big, mm -hmm. uh, and it lives mostly online, and a lot of people are sort of LARPing at it. So Just like, like you know, <laughs> like, like they do here, um, and um, you know, it's it's a phenomenon that it takes many forms, right? There, there, there are um, sort of people who are statist, uh, who are who want to go back to you know command economics, who want to go back to really extreme forms of social uh, uh, leveling, who really do want to to end neoliberal capitalism as it's practiced in China, state capitalism, they are, they are extraordinarily few. Um, there are others who are chiefly concerned with uh, holding the Communist Party to at least some of its supposed commitments to workers. And I think, you know, a lot of these are centered in universities. For example, a few years ago in 2018, for example, there was this group, this Marxist study group at Peking University uh, that got involved with a, a tech company in another province uh, where they were helping workers there to actually unionize. Now, uh, the problem with that, of course, is that trade unions are not allowed in China. There's one official trade union, right? The All China Federation of Trade Unions. And, th and that's the union to which you would belong. What does the All China Federation of Trade Unions actually do? Well, they arrange, you know, dating events and uh, and hand out cooking oil for, you know, as gifts to people around the holidays. Uh, they they are really very much more um, about maintaining labor uh, stability uh, than they are actually about forcefully representing the rights of the exploited working class in China. So, you know, this leaves... Uh, a, a major need unfulfilled in China. And so you have a lot of wildcatting, you have a lot of strikes, a surprising number of labor actions take place in China every year. You'd be very surprised. And there's an excellent book that I read, and I, I would encourage everyone to listen to at least to the podcast that I did with a scholar named Manfred Elfstrom, mm -hmm. who, who wrote an excellent book on uh, on the three it's it's you know there's resistance and the two forms of response to it responsiveness and repression and there is responsiveness even as there is repression of labor in china so like everything it's very complicated and, and it's multi-dimensional there's carrot and there's stick the way that the state has acted it has done both it has ramped up its its coercive capacity its ability to repress uh through technology through greater manpower through you know um, tactical capabilities, uh, through better intel, but it's also ramped up its responsiveness. It there are more cases in which you see labor cases settled in favor of labor, or or at least the push between labor and management. So, so the, yeah. mm -hmm. I I I kind of noticed that, but it's interesting. I, I, you know, as a side note, when I, I turn to certain kinds of Marxists, they have like denied labor actions that I'm like, no, that's recognized by the Chinese government. Like they've totally negotiated with people and said close that. to close to being actually legitimately recognized. Right. By, right. Well, well and, yeah, and yeah. It depends from region to region, but yeah, certainly like even in Guangzhou, uh, in, in, in Guangdong province in the area around Guangzhou and the Pearl river Delta, uh, they're actually close to actually recognizing this is from Alfstrom, uh, mm -hmm. the right to strike. Hmm. 
But also, like when I look at Chinese media, they talk about even if they're not talking about strikes, they are talking about labor actions, and I'm not getting that from Western sources, and I'm not also not getting it from the South China Post. So you know, it's it's not, it's it's something that is not out of the realm of possible recognition in the CPC, unlike maybe maybe you know under in the '90s or whatever. Um, well, if, if it's underreported in the West, you can you can imagine the reasons why the mm -hmm. left doesn't want to hear it, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it, it sort of destroys their idea. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about the sort of the far like, left, <laughs> yeah, right. and then of course the right uh, doesn't want. I mean, all they want to know is that these people are being completely, you know, trampled underfoot, right? By the right. Of communists. So. You know, that kind of a story is way too nuanced generally for most mainstream media to want to tell. That makes sense. Well, that leads us to, though, to kind of bring us to this Red New Deal and what's driving it, what's in it. But uh, I do want to talk about the development because a lot of what I, what I first saw as it was trickling into the United States and the Red New Deal now, and I feel more distant from China now that I'm in the States. I feel like I got better news even when I was in North Africa or, or Mexico than I do here. Um, but uh, a lot of it seemed like uh, the the Politburo finally kind of delivering on things that I've heard talked about and kind of promised in the future all the way back to Hu Jintao. But there's also stuff in this Red New Deal because it's also a bunch of policies that I don't. I don't know if you think they're cohesive or not. They're actually a set cohesive program um, or if it's just a bunch of ad hoc responses to kind of, you know, transition China into the future or somewhere in between. Um, but I was like, okay, so we, we're seeing like kinds of reforms around, you know, um, welfare that I heard like Hu Jintao promised in the future and then notice that they really hadn't been talked about a lot um, until very recently. What's driving the push towards this Red New Deal? And it, like, how cohesive is it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and Derek, it's it's not something that anyone, I think, is, is prepared to completely answer right now. Uh, mm. Because we're still seeing it take shape right now. Uh, I talked to people just maybe six weeks ago, mm -hmm. and we had a very different idea of what was happening uh, back then. Back then, I think it was still possible to see these things as not necessarily interconnected. For example, we, we could see them as uh, the result of pent up uh, regulatory demand. China had lost a year like so many other people had. There, there were other things they were dealing with, chiefly, of course, the COVID response and then getting the economy back on track. So a lot of things that had been in the pipeline uh, got stuck there. And once China sort of cleared out, uh, you know, got in the clear after it was, you know, able to essentially squash COVID and it was able to, to essentially reopen, then it turned back to these, these uh, you know, sort of uh, things in the pipeline that had been waiting for a while. And so it looks like there's more uh, regulatory actions being taken all at once. Combine this with, back then we were still saying, the logic of the political calendar so mm -hmm. it's sort of well known among people who look at china that ahead of a, a party congress especially a major one like the 20th party congress which is coming up so these these sort of even year uh or not even year but you know that every 10 years rather than every five years the party congress takes on especially important um you know significance and this time it would have been because you would usually see a leadership transition during this time. This time we're going to see an unprecedented continuation of Xi Jinping in his role as general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, but a year ahead of that is usually when you will see a lot of the major theoretical ideas congeal, the things that are going to be rolled out. A lot of things are going to get floated, trial balloonish stuff, uh, you know, things like floating a property tax idea there's a reason why that has come out and been talked about extensively a year out. And then all of these other things, right? You can, you can say, well, this is all the logic of the, the Chinese political calendar. Uh, but is that, is that all there is to it? I don't think so anymore. I think that we're now seeing um, whether this is sort of 
post hoc and sort of painted on or whether the, it was planned all along. That I can't be sure. But I, I suspect that there is some kind of method to this. And, uh, e you know, it connects things that seem incredibly disparate, right? Um, because we've seen regulatory crackdowns and everything from cram schools to real estate companies, big tech platforms, or especially sort of platform economy companies to fintech. We've seen crackdowns on celebrity culture, on fandoms, on video games, on online games, especially on online entertainment. We've seen crackdowns on uh, in, in the education sector, uh, not beyond the cram schools. I mean, cracking down on private international school, school, international private schooling, which is really big, really big in China, actually. Really big you in know? China. So, I mean, where do, how do all of these things connect? How do we, we see things that are, you know, some of these things are clearly just about uh, redistribution are, 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 you know, they, they have, they want a different outcome of, of, of wealth distribution. And that, that is totally understandable. Some of them are about taking the moral hazard out of certain industries. That's totally understandable. Some of them look like, you know, Schumpeterian creative destruction uh, in, in real estate. They're, they're going to, my theory is basically this, that China, and this is, this is, a hypothesis. I'm not going to dignify it by calling it a theory, but this is how I'm thinking about this right now. Mm -hmm. Xi Jinping and and the people around him believe that the Chinese system has been stress tested, and it's been stress tested involuntarily. But they're going to take it. Uh, that was, of course, the COVID pandemic, mm -hmm. which came out of nowhere, really clobbered China initially the first uh, couple of months. China saw 5,000 people die, which doesn't sound like a lot right now, but at, at that time seemed genuinely catastrophic. And you remember the coverage out of Wuhan in the early weeks of mm -hmm. it, even though we thought, you know, this is something that's happening in Asia. This is a uh, the result of their political system. It can't happen here. Of course it did, but because people are stupid. But um, we, we look at, at, at how they came out of that, right? They deliberately cratered their economy but it was a V-shaped recovery. They came right out of that and, and bounced back and were the only major global economy to grow in 2020, right? Right. They're the only body who actually had the mythical V-shaped recovery. Like everybody right, else. Right, right, right. Instead of like a, a very gently upsloping L shape. Right. right. <laughs> the, 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 uh, but they also uh, survived, you know, what some people had billed as this Chernobyl moment, right? Mm. You remember when the ophthalmologist Li Wenliang in, in Wuhan uh, he was an early whistleblower. Uh, right. He he said that this this coronavirus. He thought it was SARS. He said that this version of SARS is uh, there's evidence of of human to human transmissibility, and he wrote about that on his social media, and it got taken down, and he got called in for questioning. There's there's a lot of people who say, oh, he was jailed. He was never jailed, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and he probably wouldn't have been, but he took ill with with uh, with COVID, and he died in in uh in february of 2019 and uh 2020 and everyone thought this is the chernobyl moment people were very angry online and uh they survived that they came out of this whole thing draconian crackdown cratering the economy the chernobyl moment all this with i mean and and we have to admit that this is the case with greater regime support mm -hmm. with more political capital banked with more sort of rally round the flag effect with with uh, a com you know because again everything is inherently comparative. They looked at the United States, China's great other, and they saw its disastrous response. And many and this was happening during an election year. Let's not forget where mm -hmm. they were just saying, I mean that was not a good advertisement for political democracy, right? I mean no matter how we cut it, uh, they were saying. Well, uh, would you rather be here or there? I mean, the Chinese American community, a lot of Chinese people here were clamoring to get back to China. Uh, I know, I mean, I'm married to one of them. <laughs> she <laughs> wanted more than anything to get back there and we, we couldn't. So this is a, um, this is a moment they decided China can take short-term pain for long-term gain. And if, if, if there's a moment ever to really, you know, rip that bandaid off, 
a, a moment to break some eggs and make a big ass omelet. This is that moment. And so this is why I think uh, that there has been an appetite for these kinds of things. Um, probably more than anything, the, the Evergrande crisis, where it's looking more and more likely they're not going to get bailed out. They will be forced to dispose of assets. You have to remember this company, uh, it's not like Lehman Brothers. It's not like it has only vapor. It, it has actual physical real assets. So mm -hmm. it will have to, I mean, and it's, it's debt is collateral. It's, it has, you know, so it's going to have to, to cough up. Uh, it may not survive. It probably won't survive or it will maybe be taken over by the state, but they figure as long as we can make the people whole, all those people who bought apartments that before they were even built before ground was even broken, uh, they'll be made whole. Their debtors will be made largely whole. Uh, or their creditors, rather, but Evergrande will face the firing squad. It's looking like. Yeah, it's one of these things I've I have tried to get people to understand that in China, unlike in America, the there is still a beholdenness to the market and the capitalism in oh, yeah. terms of like you got to keep foreign investment coming in and blah blah blah, but but not down to the micro level like we've seen in the States. Like, you know, in the States, we are almost not willing to let firms die without massive intervention and massive qualitative easing. But it's been interesting also in the response, because I, I did seem from what I gathered from here, and again, I felt like I knew more when I was outside of the States, <laughs> um, uh, that China kind of had a 9-11 moment. And the U.S., despite everything, and with both parties now, didn't get that. So normally, historically, during these kinds of crises, you actually do, towards the end, start seeing this, this rally around the flag moment in most countries. And that's not happening, not just in the United States. It's not happening in the West in general. Um, do you mean there wasn't a lot of sympathy like uh, that other countries had for the United States after enduring September 11th? Well, the, the, I mean, partly that, but I also mean internally, like there was, there was a, like the United States in the nineties was not the most eternally cohesive country in the world, but after nine 11, for at least a month, we were right. like, you know, I remember I like, and that's not happened. In fact, what you've seen in, in response to the crisis in the United States now is social, you know, social, um, fragmentation accelerating. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. um, Right. So those, these responses were very, very different. Right. That, uh, the one increased polarization. The other seems to have, you know, really solidified uh, solidarity. I've just you've seen more solidarity. Yeah. And, um, you know, we can't ignore the fact that part of that is uh, because of this perception. And it's not an inaccurate perception that the United States handling of the COVID ep epidemic was just so catastrophic. I mean, 700 million, uh, 700,000 people died. Yeah, we're going to hit a million. Time. Probably. I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, let's hope not. I mean, that, that would be absolutely tragic. But this is uh, not something that, that Beijing has has failed to, to recognize or yeah, well, more to the point that ordinary Chinese people have failed to recognize. Well, and during this time period, I think we've seen also a liberal response to China. That's very, very, you know, we hinted at it at the beginning, but it's been very strange because in the early days, once China got out of its initial like, you know, scandal of the initiation of COVID, um, the New York Times was writing stuff that was like almost worshipful of the Chinese crackdown. Like, well, yeah, well, um, yeah, Donald McNeil was for sure, right? Uh, but you know, he he had his you know moment in Peru or whatever, and and unfortunately, he was no longer with the Times. But yeah, he was writing some very very good stuff. Um, but then you saw this immediate shift, like during the, I think for me it was even way before the you know the way before January, when I started seeing um, Biden using um, China mongering in the ads, seemingly to try to get a kind of broad social policy through. Well, so, no, I mean, China is our duct tape, right? It's our go-to for everything. I mean, as Ryan Haas, who was actually the National Security Council mm -hmm. uh, China director under Obama, was on my show once uh, where he talked about, <laughs> about this. He says, you know, if you, you know, uh, need to pass a bipartisan 
uh, infrastructure plan, talk about China. If you want to give NATO a purpose, talk about China. If you want, I mean, they're going to be using China to sell babies' diapers soon, right? <laughs> right. Um, yeah. yeah this but. Is what 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 that seems doubly unfortunate for both international relations, particularly as the the Taiwan tensions kind of bubbled up recently, but also it isn't working. Like, well, I'm not sure it's not working. Well, I, as I, far I, as like getting a legislative agenda through, it's not working. <laughs> well, part of it, I mean, look 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 how easily the you know the infrastructure part of it passed, right? Um, mm. The you know if you look at the language in the. Uh, uh, what's it called the uh the innovation and something act god why am i I'm, why am i spacing it but you know the thing that was sponsored by schumer uh that mm. went through with uh in a near unanimous vote and it was almost or it was all near unanimous on the on the uh the democrats side. the only senator who caucuses with the democrats who voted against it was bernie sanders uh and he voted against it in part because it was framed in such just obvious anti-China language. If you look at the writers that are on on it, they are pr practically laying the blame for COVID at China's feet. They are things like, you know, uh, it, it includes language that says that uh, the um, National Institutes for Health are not, or the National Science Foundation are not allowed to fund any research that go uh, in the Wuhan Institute of Virology, not allowed to fund any research that does gain a function uh, you know, on, on transmissible viruses. These are, you know, obviously aimed directly at China. Uh, there's a lot of this. Look, look, it, it goes deeper than that. I think that there's something that, that I recognized in the, in the summer of, of 2020 in that year when Trump really pulled out all the stops, you know, so you mm -hmm. remember how uh, in, in February and March, he was still, you know, he wasn't using, China virus, Wuhan flu, Kung flu, these things, right? Uh, and when, once he started doing that, he pulled out all the stops. He basically told every government agency and bureau, go after China as hard as you want. In fact, you know, I, I'll, so you, you actually had like the Department of the Interior banning Chinese made drones. I mean, it was just insane. And it went all the way down, like DOJ, obviously the DOD, you had commerce, you had every, you know, everyone going after China in some way or another. What I recognize, because the, the, the parallel was staring me in the face, was that what was happening on a, on a microcosmic level in the United States, where we saw the Black Lives Matter movement take off and we saw white America panicking at its loss of, of privilege, we saw it staring down, you know, becoming a minority, ma majority minority country. So it responded, white America responded like, you know, the, the, the McCloskeys did in St. Louis by pulling out their guns and, and, and uh, going out in, in the street. And there's this paroxysm of, of violence, right? And, and, and just sort of this incohate, I hate all those non-white people. The same thing was happening globally, is that mm -hmm. the United States was facing sort of the twilight of its period of untraveled hegemony, and it naturally turned its guns on China. It, it realized that you know China is the source of this, and so I I, re, I recognize I think that this is at a deep sort of national psychological level what what was really happening. So I think this is interesting, though, and I, the, the racial component of it kind of can't be ignored because no, can't be. because the United States and China could have a relationship like the UK and Britain did in the prior century. UK and US, right. Right. I mean, yeah, UK and US. I don't know why I said that twice. Um, or it could it's it could have what we have right now, which is more like uh, Britain, um, Germany relations. Um Historically speaking, that's not going to end super well for either party, but particularly for the one that's the declining hegemon. And furthermore, in the comment in the context of climate change, it is a possible super disaster. Yeah. Um, you Look, know, I mean, it's already it's inevitable at mm -hmm. this point. We're on track to go two point seven above 
pre-industrial temperatures and that's that's genuinely catastrophic i i in what world can you require cooperation with somebody and believe that you can hive that off and continue to shit on them and to insult them and and expect that they will somehow be able to to cooperate with you nevertheless i mean i think that's just that's wishful thinking you can't it it, it just it's 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 nonsensical and over what over right. all those military bases that china's building all over the world yeah, all four of them no like all zero out. of them really i mean there's one in in djibouti right <laughs> right like there's there are there's one formal one and two outposts that are not really bases that some people yeah, occasionally put in on a tajikistan list. there's one that's you know right people's armed police and it's it's just an observation post. it's not even military right Right. So, I mean, versus the even at the most expansive four um, versus the what, seven, eight hundred, yeah, eight hundred that, yeah. that the United States has. Um, but there is a real sense in which, like, I think everybody who's follows uh, geopolitics knows is U.S. hegemony. Our regional hegemony is pretty much, you know, what it is and what it's been since the 1850s. But. Our ability to pull stunts like we did in the end of the 90s and the aughts, that's over. Like, and yeah, it's not we'll just see. China. Well, you 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 think we'll see? Um, you see, I mean, I, I, but the problem is that it's most dangerous at that moment. Right. Well, yeah, I, well we could end up in a world war, but yeah. but uh, which, but that's not that's not what we would have seen in the in the aughts. Like, and I think. And unfortunately, I think it's a bipartisan fear. It's framed differently with Democrats, but you also see it in their weird Cold War paranoia about Russia. Like it's, in, in, you know, I mean, Russia is a military is a, a is still a serious military power, but Look, like I mean, as, Russia is different. Okay, uh, Russia <laughs> actually is. I mean, it does try to act as a spoiler. It does actively interfere in American electoral processes. And that, that's true. That is, it, it does actually kill regime critics. Right? Yeah, no, I mean, it, but, but the, the, the issue is like, it's different, but it's not. Well, I would, I would actually, you know, emphasize the difference. Okay. I mean, I mean, Russia actually did, uh, it, you know, invade a sovereign state and take a, a you know it that it recognized as being sovereign initially right maybe mm -hmm. not in its heart of hearts but it did at least de jure recognize in fact Ukraine. it set it up frankly like it ukraine's did. existence is because it of did. the way it did. this is all true and there are reasons but nevertheless it now sits on most of the east and the crimean peninsula is gone it's now part of russia right well, I mean, I, I, I think the, China doesn't. There isn't an, an analog with with China in that. There isn't an analog in a lot of the things that that, that Russia has actually done. Uh, if you look at uh, Chinese uh, so-called, you know, information operations or whatever you want to call them, yeah, there's there's industrial espionage. There have been some pretty serious hacks and things like that. But there isn't a Chinese uh, concerted effort to decenter truth to actually right. like. This just pull out the fucking epistemic rug from underneath all of us, and and you know that is actually dangerous. And if China were to do things like that, I think uh, it would be something we ought to stand up to pretty actively. But instead, what it mostly is trying to do is is say uh, you're not giving us a fair shake. Your your coverage of us is biased. Uh, Here's what China is. I mean, it, it's cheesy and it's bad. It's also visible from a mile away and it's ham fisted and ineffective. You know, if Chinese information ops were working, we wouldn't see Pew polls telling us that people hate China more and more every year. Right. right. Like if uh, the Confucius Institute was the psyop people were afraid right. it was, we would not be right. having this talk today. Exactly. Exactly. Um, well, I, I think that's a fair point in that China operates completely differently and it's linked to Russia in the United States. It's also a weird Cold War hangover because, um, as I pointed sure. out to people, BRICS is no longer really a thing. It's and not. and there are also internal tensions between um, uh, Putin and, and China's geopolitical uh, ambitions and strategies 
uh, ambitions makes it sound nefarious, but it, in it's the long still, run, it will be yeah much bigger, I think. But the the immediate you know threat of NATO, particularly as it's been acting in the last say decade, y- unifies two groups that may not have been unified, you know that much, at, you know as far as their geopolitical concerns are going, um, and. I think the interesting thing to see with that, for example, is like, how are people going to respond to um, Afghanistan and, uh, and, and establishing relations there? Um, because again, China and Russia's interest in Afghanistan, if people follow it at all, are markedly different. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's funny how, again, immediately it was, I think it was it, the, the withdrawal announcement had just been made when mm. I saw the first flurry of articles talking about how China is going to step into this vacuum. And I mean, it was just insane. Um, <laughs> yeah, really, really strange. It's that's funny some, how that's we, some we weird projection so of our own past. Exactly. Like, <laughs> We're just so fixated with <laughs> Ian Bremmer had some dumb cartoon he, you know, was rightly like lambasted for, for having, you know, like, graveyard of nations and you know you had your british in there or you had alexander and then you had the british and you had the americans and then the next of course was going to be the chinese as though this was this inexorable you know preordained fucking you know historical pattern that china was just bound to walk into yeah well the thing is i've heard that that's been a kind of meme in the united states since the 90s honestly like that china was the next global hegemon and they're going to be like yeah, us, but well, more so and worse than commie. Yeah. Like, and even on the left, I heard some of this. Like in the '90s, left before Marxism became cool again. Um, did, it, did did this? I mean, I don't know. Look, the, but the, this is the big question, right? What does China want? I think I came up. I came to a, a an interesting conclusion. I actually, I just got off the phone with a really good friend of mine mm-hmm. who's in, he thinks that this is the the biggest and best idea I've ever had. And that uh, it needs to be the center of a book, uh, and yeah, I just got off the phone with him right before we 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 spoke. Uh, we started this, but he was saying that. Um, well, I mean, I was saying that, that there's been one question at the heart of modern Chinese history uh, for the last 180 years, and that has been how does China attain wealth and power? That has been the great quest, and that has been. Uh, what every isminology, what every every system of thought, every political uh, you know belief has ultimately been about. You know whether you were an anarcho syndicalist or a Bolshevik, whether you were a, a classic liberal, whether you were a, a sort of neo Confucian, what, whatever you were in the great tumult of the ni- mid nineteenth through late 20th century, whatever political ideology you were behind, it was ultimately trying to answer, how do we become wealthy and powerful? And an answer in order to be satisfactory had to satisfy one main condition, which was whatever you give me, it has to be mine. It has to feel like it comes, it's consonant with my historical, uh, my my inheritance, Mm -hmm. traditionally, culturally, historically. And it has to be true. That is, unsentimentally, I have to be able to look out into the world and believe that this describes the reality of the world. So for a while, I think that, you know, Marxism-Leninism did that. It had the virtue of being, of explaining why China was oppressed by uh, the the, the West. And yet it came of the West, right? So Mm -hmm. it was a a kind of a wonderful, magical solution. And it did... Uh, under Mao become something that felt Chinese enough, but it didn't win. It didn't work. Did it? it didn't produce wealth and power. What my, my idea is that after 180 years from the opening salvos of the opium war till yesterday, basically for 180 years, China has been trying to answer that question. And basically now for a, critical mass of, of Chinese people, whether elites or ordinary people, they feel like they have an answer. That this, whatever you want to call it, but the China as it's run by this Confucian, Leninist, technocratic, quasi-socialist, 
quasi-communist uh, political system is an answer. It has delivered the goods. It's delivered wealth and power. It feels like ours, and it feels true in the world, especially when you look out at how other people are flailing. Mm -hmm. So then what? So if we're, I mean, but for, as I said in a recent talk that I gave where I hatched this idea, but for the the uh, kind of um, chastening example of poor Mr. Fukuyama, who declared the end of history a little maybe prematurely, I, I would hesitate to call it the end of modern Chinese history, but it does really look like a transition to something, uh, you know, there's a new question being asked. And it's just the one that you were talking about. What kind of power will China be in the world? Will it be satisfied with its own form of exceptionalism, which is very different from American exceptionalism? They're both arrogant as all get out, right? But American exceptionalism posits that its institutions, its values are true for all time and true for all the world, right? Should be imposed on all people. Everyone should want to be like us. China has not gone that way at all. In fact, it's kind of gone the other way where it's mostly till now said, well, you know, we have very peculiar cultural and, and, and environmental and natural endowment circumstances and it, it, it really wouldn't work for you. And now there are features of it that you might want to borrow, but we're not exporting a system. The system is particular to China. I don't know if that's true anymore. I don't know. I think China's starting to, to play with this idea that maybe its ideas have more universality than, than they've originally believed. So it's we're in an interesting moment right now. And what I, I would say is, is very special about this is that China isn't the only one asking this question now. We're all asking this question, what kind of power is China going to be? So we're kind of all on the same page. I don't know if that's for better or for worse. No, it depends on where you think you're going to be at the end of it. I mean, the one thing that is very clear to me from, from my standpoint, as spending a lot of time outside of the United States, that the Chinese threat to the United States is mostly soft power. And it's mostly now what I would say mutually constitutive, but initiated by the U.S. So the downward spiral has been, a you know, you, we both know it's been a long time coming. Um, but, and it has internal political usefulness in China too. And I don't want to like write that off, but I think for example, if the U S would treat China as an equal peer and partner, it probably, it wouldn't necessarily play along because that would, you know, uh, you don't just play along with a peer. You'd have to actually mean it, but I don't think it would necessarily end up with this hyper hostile declining hegemon versus new world hegemon situation. But ironically, uh, I completely agree with you. Ironically, the US stance may actually be kind of pushing something that they fear inadvertently that probably wouldn't happen otherwise. Amen. Absolutely. And you know what it is? It's the absolute lack of of security dilemma sensitivity. I mean, they, this inability to see what that board looks like from the other player's perspective. That's that's what it is. And you're absolutely right. Um, I think, look, I, I don't I'm not somebody who reaches for sort of, you know, uh, psychocultural explanations, but I've been around Chinese people my whole life and I kind of know how <laughs> they respond to things. And, uh, you know, what is going to escalate a, a, a conflict and what you know, ways there are to manage it and to live in peaceful harmony. Uh, and I tell you, it ain't, you know, ratcheting up hostility. It, 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 this, this pernicious idea that China only responds to strength is one of the, the worst that, that, that is out there in discourse on China right now. That right now, China would, I don't know about right now, because it might be too late. I mean, this is the thing that I fear the most, is that China actually has decided that irrespective of what party is in power in the United States, 
irrespective of who sits in the White House, the United States, at in its heart of hearts, wants to see China on its knees or on its belly, and that they are not, that there can be no trust extended. That's my my fear right now. I think that we had still an opportunity to re, rebuild that in January of, of 2021, but it's too late. It may be too late. <sighs> and that's deeply concerning when, like I said, when we talk about the international cooperation. And you also, t I mean, there are countries that I understand, uh, mostly in Asia, who have more legitimate concerns about China. Oh, absolutely. Than, yeah. Like Vietnam being one of them, because um, I'm that's always fair. like, if you if you believe that ideology is really what drives everything in China, explain to me how Vietnam and China are at odds, right. um, because they are very similar countries. Um, but the history is is deep on both sides, yeah. and um, yeah, and and the fact that that America has weaponized Vietnam for a very long time. Yep, and used uh, is, used is, it is not helping. Right? Is it's one of these instances of. You know what? What uh, one very wise scholar of international relations said about Taiwan, but it may be true of, of Vietnam too, is that we're loving it to death. Right. Um, I, I was kind of shocked by one of the strangest uh, rhetorical flourishes I think I have seen out of uh, the Korean Peninsula in a long time, which was Kim Jong Un making a peon to peace um, because he was afraid of U.S. China tensions. Which, <laughs> which, which is historically both ironic and wild, and and was completely missed in the U.S. press, but uh, was not missed in the South Korean, uh, even the South Korean English language press, but uh, definitely wasn't mentioned. Just for the comedy value alone, yeah, man, right. the irony is just great. <laughs> like, particularly when you're going to do a missile a missile test like a week later, but like, like the the, the signaling there is pretty amazing. Um, and I think, you know, I, I think um, what what we're seeing, I, I mean, what I've tried to get people to understand is at worst, what you're seeing with China is its own version of the Monroe Doctrine. Um, that's at the absolute most aggressive, which, which to be fair, if you're in Latin America, the Monroe Doctrine is still not great for you. Yeah. Um, it's kind of terrible, kind of historically awful, but... Um, it's not like world, it's not, you know, the 19th, 20th century world imperial ambitions that you see out in the United States. Right, right. Um, could, could it become something else? Yeah, definitely. I mean, like, you know, I, I'm not one of those people that thinks any, any national character is beyond going imperialistic. But, um, you know, and China does have, I also think sometimes Americans kind of think China Chinese policy is all about us and I'm like well but there's India and there's its own economic development and like some things it does isn't about the US at all see red right. new deal um, <laughs> you know um, so I guess though we do have to talk about some of the issues of the red new deal because there's a lot of reforms regulations in that but one of the things that's been confusing a lot of American leftists is while it while it seems to have a lot of stuff that say Warren Democrats and maybe even Bernie Sanders Democrats would have wanted in it, uh, or at least to the Lyndon Johnson variety, which is still weird for a communist country, but we'll, we'll stick with that. Um, uh, it also has a whole lot of stuff that confuses Americans about like crackdowns on sexuality, um, crackdowns on celebrity culture. People kind of yeah. get games. They kind of get cracking down on, on tech giants, because I mean, I guess we can think of Weibo as analogous to to Facebook in many ways, but um, and it was you know kind of supposed to not be that, but um, yeah, you know, you're absolutely right. This is it is it's puzzling, and it it uh, the only the the smartest take that I've I've heard on this is this is is that a moral entity that has the interests of its people truly at heart but trusts them not at all with power and to make their own decisions would be totally alien to most Western Westerners, especially Western liberals, but not to anyone with Asian parents. Yeah. Uh, so I think I heard you say it was the tiger momization of, of like, yeah, it is. The tiger momization. But I mean, the heteronormativity and the, 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 the yeah, the, the obvious, you know, kind of 
homophobia and transphobia that's in it. It's really, I mean, it's sickening. And, uh, you know, I think American progressives are, are certainly, you know, right to, to find that deeply problematic. Uh, but, you know, it, you got to remember there's, there's, this, there's the hardware and there's the software. We look at China and we, we see the gleaming forest of skyscrapers and the high speed rail and the, you know, the brand new shiny airports. And we see it's, you know, it's gigantic Navy and we think modern uh, developed country. And we're surprised when uh, the, the mentality of people seems to come from, you know, our 50 years ago. Right. Well, that's not unique to China, though. I mean, it's I definitely experienced China. that in South and in, in South Korea. Absolutely. Like it was... So you you would understand this. You right. would understand how a compressed experience of modernization. Uh, I mean, as I'm fond of reminding people, somebody who graduated from high school at the age of say seventeen or eighteen, at the dawn of reform and opening in say 1979, and took her first job when china's per capita gdp was less than two hundred dollars is now thinking about retiring this one working lifetime at a time when china's per capita gdp is over ten thousand dollars so that's one one human life you cannot cram that much change into one human life it they've they've dealt with an impressive amount already of pretty high speed change to think that they're going to completely change their minds on every issue is a little too optimistic. Alas, one of the ones where I think, especially the leadership, has decided uh, it, it, it it draws a line is on a lot of this, and and part of it is because of their readings of history. I imagine the 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 the, the, the Xi Jinping's brain trust. Some of them are extraordinarily well-read intellectuals. One character in particular, a guy named Wang Huning, uh, who is the only uh, person on the Politburo Standing Committee right now, he was appointed in 2017, who has not run either a province as general secretary or governor or a provincial level municipality. He's the only one who has it. He's run nothing but a uh, party research organization, a very powerful one, but he is a bona fide intellectual spent a lot of time in the United States, is extraordinarily well-read. But if you look at, at what he ideas he gloms onto in the United States, he was a really big fan of Alan Bloom. He was a really big fan of this, you know, this sort of conservative uh, response to the assault on the, the classical canon. He was somebody who really is a deep cultural conservative. He At some point, he's doubtless encountered the idea that a symptom of societal decadence and inevitable decline is tolerance for homosexuals and other sexual deviants. So he looks, for example, at you know uh, Rome in the third century, uh, or he looks at uh, you know, and and he only needs to look at his own um, his history. He needs to look at you know Tang at, in its apogee. He look at, looking at Ming in its period before it collapsed at the Qing before it's collapsed. And he sees this, right? He sees the emperor taking a particular shine to a, a handsome guardsman and then the empire declining. Right. So the, the, unfortunately, and I, I cannot emphasize this enough. I, I really detest this aspect of it, but uh, I, I think this is sort of where it comes from. Well, I guess I would not only agree with that, but I would I would press that the problem with a lot of American progressives is they're siloed from the fact that they also haven't achieved this uh, in a whole lot of their own country, um, even in areas where many progressive ideas would otherwise be popular. And I think, you yeah. know, I, I mean, we get, I, I think we can really look at it institutionally here. Gay mm -hmm. marriage is now recognized in all. That's history. true. I mean, yeah. the, it's the law of the land. Although there's a lot of states that would reverse it if they had the chance. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I, it still says something. I mean, you, you look at where Barack Obama came during the course of his presidency. I and mean, he, he entered the White House still in opposition to gay marriage. Right. 
and Biden slightly forced his hand actually, but yeah, good for him. Um, but it's it's interesting to think about that now because I, I also think a lot of American progressives are kind of not taking how how reaction in this in America is is seriously enough, even after the Texas law. Um, and all these bathroom laws. And um, I mean, it's a major, I'm a public school teacher and it's a major deal here. Um, there's always some kind of. Uh, are you teaching to, critical race theory? Well, it's actually expanded to, are you teaching social and emotional learning, which oh, here right. is just an anti-suicide program. <laughs> like, um, like it's, 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 so it's not just critical race theory. No, you, 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 you make an excellent point. Yeah. I think American progressives should realize they haven't won all the battles here. And, you know, we have less of an excuse. Right. Well, one thing I would say is um, if you were a leftist in America who wanted a, let's say, less imperial foreign policy and yeah, also, so <laughs> yeah, and, right. yeah, um, and you also wanted social progressivism um, in places, but on on their terms. How in the world would you go about encouraging that? Because yeah, so let me let me give total credit here <laughs> to a body of ideas that have been developed by two people who I think are just the Batman and Robin, and I'm not sure which is which, but of of uh, progressive internationalism, which is exactly what you're talking about right here, right? Mm -hmm. So I would urge anyone who's interested in this topic to follow the work of Tobita Chow. T O B I T A, Tobita, it goes by Toby. Mm -hmm. And Jake Werner. Jake uh, is a PhD from, from Chicago. I think he's got an appointment now at Boston University, but he's brilliant. The two of them are absolutely brilliant, and they've written about this a lot. I wouldn't do their ideas justice, but they really are looking for uh, to, to find, uh, you know, a progressive internationalist approach that centers, you know, opposition to ethno-nationalism, right? That centers uh, the the work, rights of the worker in a globalized context. Uh, they're really good. I, I, I find not only are their ideas super solid, in, you know, just sort of from an ideological point of view, from a, a moral and ethical point of view, but they're practicable and they do the work. They, they, they do the research. Um, I'm not talking about doing your own research. I mean, they, they do field work on, on this stuff and really impressive. Please check them out and don't listen to me on this. Listen to them. You can go to uh, Justice is Global. I have reached out Absolutely. to... Absolutely, Justice uh, is Global. That's, that's what their organization is called. Uh, Tobita, myself, hopefully hopefully I can get them on. Um, Please but do. It, you know, uh, I... I uh, they were recently on a friend of mine's show um, uh, talking about China in a way that on a, on a, on a podcast that's even more in uh, American Maoist territory in a lot of ways. Um, and this is revolution, which is, this is revolution, which is, which is a show out of Oakland um, run by two African, uh, well, actually one Haitian and one African American friend of mine, um, Pascal Robert and Jason Miles. And yeah, I, uh, that show. I got, I got to check that out. Um, How'd they I, do? Worked with them not, uh, I thought they did well. Um, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, um, I had heard of, uh, uh, Tobita before because I was looking for, okay, what, what can I get about China that is not anti China, which even on some parts of the left gets a little bit ridiculous sometimes. And, or, or just, apologia that's beyond what the c uh what the cpc would even do right um so you know where am i gonna find some that? I mean, that? Th those those two things they both yeah so i i understand so easily uh why a lot of people on the left would would be anti-china as it were i mean after all there are a lot of outrages that have been perpetrated right i mean how can you see the extra legal detentions that have happened in xinjiang this you know kind of rampant great Han chauvinism that you've, you've seen in so many different manifestations, whether it's in Inner Mongolia or it's in Tibet or in Xinjiang. Uh, yeah, of course, that, 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 uh, that's deeply problematic. Uh, a lot of people will look at Hong Kong and, and, and conclude the same thing. All I can say to, to those people is, you know, 
it isn't as simple as you think. You really act, still need to think about uh, if you look at a situation like like Xinjiang, and this by no way is intended to exonerate uh, what what Beijing has done, but you need to understand that it has gigantic blind spots that you would have to had you had this experience. If you were the victim of colonialism, it's hard then to to understand yourself as a colonializer. It really mm-hmm. becomes very hard. Um, if you, Asking, yeah. it's 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 absolutely the case here. Um, you know, the urge to what aboutist responses is really hard to suppress. It's hard for Chinese people, uh, even ones who recognize that there's an injustice being done, to not say, well, look at you. Do you have the moral standing to make this this kind of an accusation? Why do you prioritize this? It's easy for them to then conclude that it is because it is China, because you have been sucked in by this discourse that weaponizes this issue against China. So why don't you back off? And I understand, I understand that. And taken too far though, unfortunately you become in, in this sort of tanky apologist camp. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's a really, really hard line to walk. I would point you to Darren Byler as somebody who walks that line really well. Because he is of the left. He does not want to be, and he understands that he is often picked up and used as a bludgeon by, you know, by colonial power number one, the United States, uh, in its sort of discursive war against China. Uh, And he's resentful of that. But he is so deeply uh, connected to the actual uh, atrocities that are being connected committed there and so knowledgeable about them so i I would look suggest that you look at him too he doesn't have another agenda yeah i think that's one of the things when we talk about you know um the uyghur phenomenon is almost everybody in the west who's reporting on it has an agenda agenda my, my southern accent came out um and it's it's frustrating um but it's also something you know, I was talking to my friend Jean Bajlan, who is a uh, you know a Kurdish scholar of Kurdish-Turkish relations and 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 Middle Eastern history in the Ottoman Empire, and our response was both: this is really unfortunate, and it could be better, but it could also be a lot worse. See, the United States, not but but these things are usually the indefensible results of nation-building projects, and the and there is a sense in which I think. The solidification of not just Han nationalism, but China as a nation, um, is is being done yeah. right now. Like, so that's, yeah, no, absolutely, and and you know, unfortunately, this wasn't happening when everyone else was doing it. You know, in the 18th century or the 19th right. century. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it again. This is one of these things that a lot of Chinese people experience emotionally. They feel like, I mean, it's the same with say, um. Environment, better environmental stewardship. It's like you guys pigged off out at that at, at that hydrocarbon trough for 150 years, and now you're telling me not. I mean, it's that kind of thing. Uh, right. But yeah, Which, absolutely. More than I mean, China has a reason to say that. So, but yes, um, it's. And I mean, I honestly think while China needs to do better and has to do better, they also aren't nearly doing as bad as sometimes they're portrayed in the West as doing. I mean, there's again, there's this weird hyper apology on one end where people will try to portray like, yeah, China's aiming towards a green utopia. And I'm like, no, they're not like, no, there's not, but right. there there's this other end where, you know, there's a lot of people in trying to realize that if they destroy their environment and the world's environment, that nobody exists and everybody no, understands no. that. So <laughs> there's, there's an attempt to move and move faster than we're moving. Um, yeah. It's probably not going to be fast enough, but I mean, so shaming them there from our perspective, like, is it? It does feel like a joke, even to me. Like, it's just like, I mean, yeah, we need we need a lot better from everybody. And China has the, lar- has the largest population in the world and the most GDP, so it's going to have to do the most work. But also, it's not fair. There's no there's no fairness about it. Like, 
it's it's and emotionally i would get that like i'd be like oh well you know who are you to tell me what to do you guys you guys were not only were you doing it you did most of it in the last 60 years i mean right. most of our hydrocarbon you know expo expulsions in the environment are post the 60s even which i don't right, think most right, people right. even understand most people don't know that right you know so it's it's not just that you did it you did it recently um it's um it's it's but it, it does seem like a kind of that almost seems like a prisoner's dilemma problem or some right. kind of weird like all answers feel bad if you're chinese um particularly when you're hearing it from some western white guy so no i mean I think the whole lesson here is and and i i'm, I'm i see that you're a, a practitioner of it it's all about cognitive empathy right i mean it's all about trying to think your way into that chinese head and trying to see things from their perspective and uh you know, I can see that you have a, a lot of, you know, sensitivity and then it comes like, I think you've made reference to from having seen the United States from the outside. Yeah. You, you really do need to, I know this, I, this can sound like a privileged person telling people this. And I, I'm going to say this cause I, I grew up really poor and I was just really lucky. Um, but once you leave the U S and you start looking at U.S. policy. That you usually most people have one or two options they can do. They can become more cognitively, you know, try to understand why people feel the way they do. Um, or or they get really defensive, yeah. Or yeah, I mean, or I've seen people become hyper nationalists when yeah, they yeah. get back. So, um, and but nobody is unchanged by it, right? It always changes you, and I think. I mean, that is one of the that is one of the frustrations about American exceptionalism is because America. You know, the United States is kind of a parochial society in that people don't even know most of the United States that well, like, right, right, right. like much less. But they experience it now through a through a media lens all the time, and they can feel like they know more than they do. Um, and particularly right. when it comes to China, because China is one of these places is both everywhere and it influences our lives in every way, but does still feel pretty cordoned off, like, um. Even when I was in South Korea, sometimes getting good news about what was going on in China was actually kind of difficult without knowing someone in the ground on China in China, which you can do, but it's hard. Well, I'm glad you found us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it helped. Um, I mean, I also remember just just so people know, we're, the U.S. is not the only people with weird Chinese stereotypes. Um, you know, all these rumors of like baby pills and cannibalism and stuff that were going through South Korea at the time. Um, um, about traditional Chinese medicine and and whatnot, which was which was wild. Um, some of which are actually aimed at Chinese Koreans and a kind of internal ethnic dispute to ethnic Koreans and something that <laughs> that uh, I also think Americans know nothing about. But it's they're also I think I think the one thing though that I that I kind of that I want people to understand is while I think China is a fairly strong, it has a very strong national identity now and kind of has for a long time. Um, it is also, you know, it, it is a nation that is born of a bunch of different empires and there's a bunch of different peoples and their experience of China is often very different. Um, you know, when I, and it, it even affected me when I was in Egypt, because in Egypt, there was a large Chinese uh, worker population. And a lot of them happened to be Uyghurs. You know, I wonder why they were there. You know, <laughs> like, and so I actually did get a lot of that side of the story. Whereas when I was in, in, in South Korea, I had no idea that was even going on. Um, yeah. You know, I'd mostly hear about uh, Chinese relations with the North or uh, in the the quasi autonomous Korean zone in China, which Americans forget exists. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, tensions between uh, Chinese and South Koreans when the, and the Chinese were not Chinese, they were Chinese Koreans. And so I learned about that from that. And that experience of, of China is not a monolithic state is, is kind of interesting. I wonder, do you think uh, the how do you think the CPC feels about the perception of China as as a unified monolith outside of China? Does it does it serve their agenda or does it hurt it? Yeah, I have to say that, um, you know, they, they, they certainly contribute to it, uh, <laughs> to that perception. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's a it's a point of great frustration for me 
because I'm always trying to, you know, to, to cajole people into not recognizing seeing it as a monolith. And, you know, the party works athwart my efforts. Uh, <laughs> no, of course, they, they want to project this image of unity, um, you know, that we all speak with one voice, which is patent nonsense. Uh, but, of course, only when it's convenient to do that, when, it, when, when you know, they'll, they'll complain loudly if China is being treated as a monolith in an unfavorable way. But, uh, yeah. I, I don't know how much more there is to say on that topic. All right. Um, uh, but sure, yeah. I mean, I, I think it's it's highly problematic uh, that that they, I mean, this is part of their, their inability to project any real soft power in the world is that uh, they, they always want to present this one official voice rather than the much more attractive multitude of voices that, that are actually there. So, and on that note, I think we can start ra uh, to wrap it up. I guess one thing I was going to ask you actually related to that is, do you see Chinese soft power getting more um, uh, subtle and more friendly towards, I mean, outsiders, Westerners, et cetera? Uh, um, so I would, I would answer that by saying that uh, as directed toward the West, it's gotten much worse. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're, you know, certainly losing ground. Uh, if soft power is defined as the power of attraction rather than coercion or payments, then absolutely it's gotten much worse. But uh, Chinese soft power in the global South has risen appreciably. Yeah, it feels uh, like it has in Latin no America. Yeah, yeah. And even even in places like uh, like South Korea, where there's historical tensions, things seem to have gotten better. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I, from people that I've talked to in South Korea, that in, even in the last few years, that the rhetoric towards China has softened, and at least there's an attempt to kind of do that whole "we're going to play both sides," um, yeah. as opposed to you know uh, picking a hard line one way or the other. Um, uh, is there anything you'd like to suggest, plug, or endorse on your way? You know, as we wrap up. You know, I I just recorded a podcast today that will drop next week. Uh, about that intellectual that I was talking about, this guy named Wang Huning, mm -hmm. who is uh, on the Politburo Standing Committee. And I had the immense pleasure of talking to two of the, the greatest scholars on Chinese intellectual history and its nexus with politics, Timothy Cheek of the University of British Columbia and Joseph Fusmith of Boston University. And we also had a young scholar uh, who's done a lot of work on this guy on Wang Huning. Uh, his name is Matthew Johnson. And it was, uh, I think it'll it'll really be of tremendous interest to a lot of people who are, are interested in China. A lot of stuff that's going to be pretty in the weeds. You may need to scurry off and read some Wikipedia articles here and there, but it, it's um, it's solid. So let me, let me plug that. Yeah, I would say if for people who want to check out Seneca Podcast or any of the podcasts on the Seneca Podcast Network, um, listen to three of them. Uh, because the first one you might get might be kind of like you already have to know things. But if, if I've found that if you listen to three podcasts, you'll get enough context that you, the conversation will start picking up. Um, I will also say that the, you have a pretty good diversity of voices. And for people who think like who are used to hear or who are used to mostly left adjacent people. And except when I occasionally get a libertarian on to talk about foreign policy, um, mm -hmm. it, it'll be a little bit more of a diverse for, from that perspective. And there'll be a lot more like there's a lot more centrist levels basically on that channel. But there and and uh, there's also Jeremy Goldcorn, who, if you haven't listened to him for a long time, can sound a lot more harsh than he probably is um uh but uh i would say that uh yeah listen to three uh episodes before you decide that it's that it's not worth your time because you'll learn a lot um uh anything else uh any writers you want to plug that you haven't you plugged a bunch but I, I think these are areas that my audience doesn't know much about yeah so i mean th there's there's definitely some books that i would i would recommend if anyone's looking for just a really good intro to to china to modern china um there's one book in particular that I would I would uh, recommend right now. It's uh, by uh, let me let me make sure that I, I have his name because I, I I don't I usually refer to him by his first name. Um, Klaus Mulhan, 
Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the book that he he wrote is called Making China Modern from the Great Qing to Xi Jinping. And it came out in 2019. And it's it's a really good, balanced, up-to-date uh, sort of intro text. It's meant as kind of a good undergraduate textbook uh a survey of on modern China and it's 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 well written and, and very smart. Another book that I would recommend, uh, a, a really recent one for people who are interested in, uh, who are a little more wonky and they want to get into it. There's a really good book by a uh, German. Uh, well, funny, I'm recommending two Germans or because uh, Klaus Mühlhahn is obviously German, but Isabella Weber, uh, her book. Uh, on how China escaped debt trap, or I'm sorry, how, how China escaped shock therapy is really, really quite good. Uh, All right. Check that out. Uh, thank you, Kaiser. And people should check out SEP China and you'll find all the podcasts there. There's a lot of very interesting ones for a lot of my uh, people interested in international politics. I strongly suggest you listen to the China and Africa podcast. Absolutely. That's yeah. You should get Eric on this show. He's just yeah. fantastic. Okay. Um, and, uh, yeah, I was actually planning on it because that's that podcast like is very prescient for people to care about global south issues. Yeah, he's amazing. They're both amazing. So um, so check out uh, Kaiser's work over at Sub China. You can find all the podcasts there. And thank you, Kaiser. And we're going to end. Thank you, Derek. Take care. All right. Take care. Yeah.